The Life and Death of Lord Ninian Crichton Stewart, my grandfather. Um, 101 years ago, in February 1915, the local news was that Falkland Estates pri prize border Leicester Ram, His Majesty, had been found dead. A wounded soldier had arrived at the house of Falkland that was being run as a convalescent home by my grandmother Ismay, and my grandfather Lord Ninian, who was on the Western Front with his battalion, was especially happy as he'd received a food hamper from his mother. However, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's go back to the beginning of my grandfather's story. Ninian was the third son, third child of John Patrick Crichton Stewart, the Marquis of Butte, and his wife Gwendolyn. Ninian was born at 5.05 p.m. on Tuesday the 15th of May 1883 at Dumfries House. He had an older brother John and a sister Margaret. He was christened the next day with the Celtic name of Ninian, and his father proudly recorded that both he and his mama were both exceedingly flourishing. When they were growing up, the children often travelled abroad with their parents, plus a retinue of servants, and they became fluent in many languages. Back home, the family moved between homes in London, <coughs> Scotland and Wales, and although they lived in opulent architectural showpieces, they were also family homes, so that Ninian could write to his mother from Cardiff Castle, saying that the weather wasn't very good and so they couldn't go out for a walk. However, they were able to stay in and had a good game of hockey in the banqueting hall. <laughs> the children's upbringing was conventional upper class, but their schoolroom curriculum was much wider than the norm. The Buttes weren't particularly hands-on parents, but Gwen was very keen on family theatricals. And this photograph shows three rather grumpy looking boys um, dressed up for elves in Gwen's 1890 production of Alice in Wonderland. I expect, like, you, like myself, many of you will not remember there being elves in Alice in Wonderland. However, in that production there were. <coughs> the earliest letter that I found written by Ninian is one that he wrote aged four from Cardiff Castle to his father. As you can see it reads, <coughs> My dear father, I wish you many happy returns of your birthday. I'm a colonel now, your loving Ninian. <laughs> Ninian studied maths, science, classics, German, French, and music. And he was very enthusiastic about the Army School Corps and very keen on art. <coughs> he often sent home little sketches to his par parents. So by the age of 16, he was reading Sherlock Holmes, had taken up smoking, <coughs> he'd learned to play whist, and he already had an interest in clothes. He wrote to his mother from school, I'm debating in my own mind, and I can't come to a decision as to whether I can come up to London wearing a tie pin or not. <laughs> <coughs> his school report now said, always willing to make an effort when especially called for, but one has to keep calling. <laughs> as the second son, the spare, there will have been discussion as to what he should do on leaving school, whether it was to be university, the army, or even the diplomatic corps. Early in 1900, it was agreed that he should sit the entrance exam for his father's old college, Christchurch, Oxford. He left Harrow and was crammed through the summer, took the entrance exam in September, and then, together with a tutor, set off for Kiev to study Russian. Ten days later, he received the news of his father's death. 17-year-old Ninian wrote a tender letter to his mother saying, Remember please that it is God's will and that it must be for the best or it would not happen. He then swiftly moved on to a tale about using his Russian to buy a box of matches. And the letter's postscript reads, I got a bath last night, most delightful. <coughs> Butte had wished that his heart be buried on the Mount of Olives in the Holy Land. So Gwen, his widow, John, the new Marquis, Margaret and Colin, met up with Ninian and they travelled to Jerusalem. 
Ninian told his mother, my ambition always was and is to be a worthy son and to follow as closely as possible in the steps pointed out to me by father. He returned to Kiev and just weeks later, at the end of January 1901, his tutor telegrammed Gwen Butte, Ninian ill typhus, will you send somebody? A nurse was rushed out to Kiev and by mid-March Ninian was back in England recuperating. But a side effect of typhus is a weakening of the immune system and this may have been the cause of Ninian's subsequent poor health. As Ninian did not come of age until 1904, the estate was managed by his trustees and the estate factors, Major William Wood and later George Gavin, and the House of Falkland was rarely used. The entrance exam for Oxford University had to be resat, and Ninian spent the summer at Falkland cramming and playing tennis. Fortunately, he passed and he went up to Oxford in the summer of 1901. There's a massive correspondence between the mother and son about furnishing his college rooms and he was also asking for food hampers from Fortnum and Mason for his dinner parties. <laughs> the next few years at Oxford were spent doing some academic work and generally having a good time. <coughs> he was known to be extremely well turned out and an avid motorist, sportsman and race goer. Periodically he gave up cigarettes and wine. He described Oxford as dull as ditch water. During vacations, he travelled abroad. He spent the summer of 1902 in Germany studying the language and then returned to take part in the coronation of King Edward VII, where he was a gold staff officer <coughs> whose role was to marshal the guests inside Westminster Abbey. Long term, Ninian wanted to go into politics, but his next move was to join the army. This required serious cramming prior to sitting the army exam in June 1903. He wrote to his mother, my career has not up to now been altogether successful in the way of work, but I am really going to try and do something and help the family a bit. However, he failed the exam on the first attempt. In May 1904, he came of age. As we know from um, the research done by Tom Playfair, there is a huge amount of correspondence between Ninian's mother, the estate factor George Gavin, and the family solicitor on behalf of the trustees, making the arrangements for lunches, teas, dinners, dances, music, decorations, receptions, speeches, and gifts. Falkland Town Council under Provost Robert Miller resolved by a majority of one to present Ninian with the freedom of the borough, but only on the understanding that no expense was to be incurred by the common good or to the ratepayers. <laughs> At a dinner for the estate staff and tenants held in a marquee in the palace courtyard, Ninian said it will be my chief aim in life to follow in the footsteps of my father and to profit by the example which he set me, to make my aim, as was my father, to ever bear in mind that the possession of an estate brings with it the responsibility of watching over, over all those connected with it. The total cost of the celebrations for his coming of age was £270 for 112 guests at the tenor's, tenant's dinner, 95 at the employees event, 200 at a dance, and 250 children at a special tea, <coughs> accompanied by 20 teachers. It's very difficult to calculate um, costs from the turn of the century with modern day, but potentially that could be around £20,000 in today's money. It seems there'd been a little over-catering <laughs> as four dozen bottles of whiskey were returned to the wine merchant. <laughs> Ninian graduated from Oxford that summer and applied for an army commission. It was around that time that he had a court summons for driving a motor car at a dangerous speed <coughs> and colliding with a milk cart. The Dundee Courier headline was 
Ife Laird charged with furious driving, but he got off. <laughs> it took Ninian several attempts to pass the army exam and to gain a commission. By May 1905, he was a second lieutenant in the 1st Battalion Scots Guards, and this was to be his life for the next two years. <clears throat> However, Ninian then blew hot and cold about the army, and when stationed in Aldershot, frequently drove up to London and the bright lights. In the spring of 1905, Ninian's elder brother John, the Marks of Butte, announced his engagement to Augusta Bellingham. Ninian was the best man at the July wedding in Ireland, and the boys, John, Ninian and Colum, were all decked out in town. <coughs> The wedding was filmed in what is possibly one of the earliest private wedding movies, and I put together a few screen grabs. <clears throat> so when the bridal couple come out of the chapel, they're followed by Ninian, who is the best man, um, and with him is uh, one of the bridesmaids, Ismay Pres Preston. You can see that Ninian has got an absolutely outrageous sort of feather in his Scotch bonnet. So this meeting with Ismay Preston was to be a turning point for both of them. Three months later, the Buttes held a huge garden party in Cardiff, and Ninian and Ismay were in the house party at Cardiff Castle. They were already unofficially engaged, and they wrote to each other every day, and if they couldn't write, they would send a telegram. I'm afraid rather guiltily I've read through masses of these letters. It seems that Ninian suddenly matures so he can write to her saying, you've changed me from a boy to a man, from a person who was hopeless, helpless and weary to one who has strength and hope. Their engagement was made public, but it seemed to be that there are army conventions that you have to have completed a certain time of service and to be a first lieutenant before marrying. However, in June 1906, 23 year old second lieutenant Lord Ninian went ahead and married Ismay Preston almost exactly a year after they met. The ceremony took place at her family home, Gormanston Castle, near Dublin, and the honeymoon was spent on the west coast of Scotland. There were celebrations in Falkland. There was another dance in a marquee in the palace courtyard. The music was provided by a band from Cooper and the catering was done by the Bruce Arms. This time, Mr. Gavin calculated that the costs in connection with the marriage rejoicing was 190 pounds and tuppence. <laughs> the House of Falkland had been let from early 1905 and in autumn 1906, Ninian and Ismay rented a house in London and then prepared for the birth of their first child. <coughs> the baby was late and there was great nervousness that the baby was going to be born on April Fool's Day. <laughs> but in the event, a baby boy was born on the 30th of March, Easter Sunday. His mother-in-law recorded, Ninian is like a dog with a tin tail. The baby was christened Ninian Patrick, but was always known as Ringan, which is a variation of Ninian. In Falkland, to celebrate the birth of the new heir to the estate, the estate employees were given a day's holiday and an extra day's pay. Flags were hoisted on the palace battlements and the town hall. Bells were rung and there was a bonfire on the East Lomond. The Ninians soon got back into their busy social life. They were known as the Gadabouts, whereas <coughs> Ninian's elder brother, the Buttes were known as the stay-at-homes. Ninian, who now, by now had a fairly unsuccessful racehorse name, named Clean Linen, was promoted to lieutenant. He mounted the guard at Buckingham Palace and in July 1907 resigned his commission after two years in the army. At Falkland, under the supervision of his mother, the chapel royal in the palace had been fitted up for Catholic worship, and the tapestries now in the chapel gallery were purchased for the massive sum of £1,537.18. Shillings. 
alterations were made up at the House of Falkland to produce a billiard room and this had a special carved chimney piece which had um, a coat of arms which had Ninian and his wife's initials in the centre of it. Ninian being a key motorist had alterations made at the stables to provide a house for a chauffeur, a garage and two new and several new loose boxes. Um, this here is Ninian's horse called Royal Wingfield, also not a terribly successful race horse. Um, it was being exhibited at Cooper. Around this time, the Cardiff Conservative Association informally approached Ninian about standing as their candidate in the next general election. I found the British political situation between the Boer War and the Great War extremely complicated, but suffice to say that the Conservatives led by Arthur Balfour were in alliance with the Liberal Unionists, and so were often called the Unionists, and they favoured uh, tariff reform and opposed Irish Home Rule, while the Liberals under Campbell Bannerman and later Asquith were often referred to as the radicals and they supported free trade as you can see in the picture on the left. Um, they supported Irish Home Rule and House of Lords reform. As you probably know, Asquith was the Liberal MP for East Fife. The 1906 general election had resulted in a Liberal landslide. The Conservatives had lost 246 seats. They had no MPs in Wales. And the sitting MP for Cardiff, a Liberal, had a majority of 3,000. 3, so the Cardiff seat was absolutely no pushover. Ninian, Ismay and Baby Ringan made their first visit to Falkland at the end of August 1907. Ismay wrote to her mother-in-law, We were so happy at reaching home. We had a splendid reception and Ninian was greatly touched. There were addresses by the town and speeches at a banquet. The village was decorated most charmingly and the crowds cheered wildly. Baby Ring behaved perfectly and created great enthusiasm by his happy smiles. He didn't mind the noise one bit and sat on my knee quite quietly when we drove on from the town even with the fact that there was a piper at the front. When we got to the lodge gates, they unhooked the horses and dragged the carriage up the drive. Later that month, Ninian went to Cardiff for the Conservative selection meeting. The Western Mail newspaper noted that the Butte family had previously represented Cardiff in the Commons, but as Liberals. It felt Lord Ninian is certain to make a popular candidate a frank and engaging way and a downright manner of speaking his mind will strongly appeal to the electorate. <coughs> There's a cartoonist called J.M. Staniforth who worked for the Conservative Supporting Western Mail and he started to document Ninian's political career in Cardiff. This was the very first cartoon, a call for help. So you've got Cardiff um, the damsel here, who is bound in chains by the radicals, Acker, the liberals, and she's calling to a knight, um, asking him to, to free her. My grandmother Ismay described the selection meeting. She said that Ninian was exceedingly nervous, but the reception was amazing. The meeting was packed and overflowing into the street. The audience stood and roared a welcome, and this steadied Ninian. The speech went very well. Three times they stood and cheered, and then they sang for He's a Jolly Good Fellow. This is an, an, another cartoon shortly after he was selection, selected. Lord Ninian the Worker, a story of enthusiasm. Ninian threw himself in getting to know the constituency. 
Brownie later said, my husband went among the people of every class. He learned a great deal about Cardiff, its commerce and interests. He never refused to see anyone who wished to see him and never considered anything too much trouble. I'm sure this is the secret of success. Years later, Ninian's younger brother Colum told my father that Ninian had that rare gift, the common touch. However, it wasn't only in South Wales that Ninian threw himself into public life. He became a member of the Cooper District Council and sat on numerous committees discussing things like licensing hours, foot and mouth disease, road widening at the Newton, and the ongoing Falkland Light Railway proposal. On Falkland Estate, he invested in a flock of prize-winning Border Leicester sheep. And through his efforts on the Fife Agricultural Society, he successfully canvassed for the Highland and Agricultural Show to come to Cooper in 1912. This really was a very big deal. Ninian was the president of numerous local societies and charities, while Granny spent her summers opening fates and chairing meetings of the Women's Unionist Society in Falkland Drill Hall. This is what she would wear when she went out and about, and this is a picture of her in her splendid hat at the opening of the Springfield Flower Show. There was ongoing uncertainty as to when the next general election would be called. The Cardiff Liberals were in a panic because their sitting MP was not re-standing, so they made approaches to various politicians, including Lloyd George. Meanwhile, you also had the Independent Labour Party thinking about fielding a candidate. However, Ninian said it did not make the slightest difference to him as to who opposed him. He was full of fight. The election was called, and on the 20th of December, Ninian was adopted as the candidate. In those days, the electorate was much smaller than now, and election campaigns were much shorter, and amazingly, they were suspended over Christmas and New Year. While Ninian was at a meeting in Cardiff, his daughter, who was also to be named Ismay, was born at the House of Falkland, and he heard the news when he got on the train to Edinburgh. His wife reported, Ninian is so proud of her and carries her about with great success. The year of 1910 was to be one of great highs and lows for Ninian and his wife. Polling day in Cardiff was on the 19th of January. It was a two-horse race between the Liberals and the Conservatives. This is Ninian's general election uh, pledges, uh, particularly like the bit at the bottom, every vote against Lord Ninian is a vote for socialism and unemployment, a vote for the foreigner against the Britisher. <laughs> uh, the Western Mail reported that Lord Ninian is putting in prodigious work, even for a parliamentary candidate, and one day's schedule started at the dock gates at 5.30 a.m and another day he shook hands with nearly 1,300 workers. On the day of the election, both sides had campaigners out in force. Ninian's young son, Ringan, joined in, going about in a car with a banner reading, Vote for my daddy. <laughs> the turnout was a remarkable 87%. But despite all the hard work, the Liberals held the seat, but with their majority halved. Although the result was disappointing, Ninian pledged that he would give it another shot. His supporters were not discouraged. When he left Cardiff to go elsewhere and campaign, there was a massive floodlight procession as he went to the station. The result of the election was another Liberal government. Tragedy was to strike Ninian and Ismay just two weeks later. Within days of their return to Falkland, young Ringan fell ill. The suggestion that he had caught a chill on election day was refuted. Doctors were called out from Edinburgh and he was given lumbar punctures and saline drips. But he died on the 4th of February, aged two years and ten months. 
The notice in the Times gave the cause of his death as heart failure following convulsions. His parents were distraught. There was a sad funeral with his small coffin carried by estate workers through the snow, and he was buried on the edge of the home park. My grandmother had a nervous breakdown, and Ninian was never able to speak of his son. They went abroad, but with a fast-moving political situation and the likelihood of another general election, they returned to Wales in early April, and Ninian resumed his duties on Fife County Council. <coughs> the recently elected Liberal MP for Cardiff, David Thomas, had already indicated that he would not restand.